So apologies for the notes. I don't normally like to read my lines, but uh, if, like me, you've had about eight meetings today, <laughs> you'll know that the word-finding difficulty is real. <laughs> um, so hi, everyone. I'm Joanne Peter, a Director of uh, Social Innovation in Johnson & Johnson's Global Community Impact Team. For decades, GCI has been working to support and champion the people at the front lines who are at the heart of delivering care. Because we believe that every health worker trained and supported helps us to build a stronger community and every strengthened community brings the world one step closer to achieving our global aspirations of health for all. So before we begin, just uh, thank you to our hosts um, at Skoll and of course to our uh, many experts and innovators who will be joining us uh, on stage in a moment. We appreciate it. All right, so all, as all of us in the room know, good health begins in our homes and in our communities. But half of the world is lacking access to essential health services. And we know that there is about a 9 million deficit in terms of nurses and midwives and around 2 million community health workers in Africa alone. And those that are in the health workforce are often lacking the tools and training and support that they need. So how can we effectively deliver care when the people who are keeping our communities healthy don't have the tools that they need to succeed? And how can we achieve health for all when the greatest gaps are the ones that are closest to home? So today you're going to get a chance to uh, hear from some of our speakers on how technology is sharing some of the answers to some of these questions, bringing together health and community-based primary care. Our panelists are accelerating the possibility to improve access and quality of care delivery from Kathmandu to Nairobi, Mumbai to Johannesburg. Thanks. So we're honored to kick off with our keynote from uh, Dr. Peter Drobak. Let me get his bio correct. He's the Director of Social Entrepreneurship at the Said Business School here at Oxford. Uh, before that global health physician and social entrepreneur, he was co-founder and the first executive director of the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. And for over a decade, he played a key role in transforming Rwanda's health system, which has delivered unprecedented gains in population health and prosperity. As executive director of Partners in Health in Rwanda, he established community-based health system incubators that developed and scaled healthcare delivery innovations from infectious diseases to cancer. So today he'll share why we must treat the system and not the symptoms of global health inequities. So without further ado, welcome. Hi everyone. I haven't quite lost my voice yet, it's coming, but hopefully it'll last till tomorrow. Um, great to see you all, they're really comfy couches in the front if anybody wants to join us up here. Um, this house believes that tech for good is a false promise. That's the proposition that's about to be debated down the street at the Oxford Union, the world's most famous debating chamber. Um, and we happen to organize that as part of our School World Forum debate. I'm supposed to be there, actually. Um, but the irony when I was asked to come and talk about the role of technology in community-based healthcare was too delicious not to be a part of this. Um, uh, and so, uh, so I just had to, had to be here and be with you all. Uh, I'm sorry to report that the internet has not ended poverty, that AI has not cured racism, and blockchain has not fixed corruption. We still have a long ways to go, right? Um, during our lifetime, during my time in Rwanda, we've seen um, the, the steepest gains in, in uh, population health and human prosperity probably ever documented, but we know we still have a long way to go. Joanne cited some of those statistics. 15,000 kids are still dying every day, and they're dying stupid deaths, right? For stuff we know how to prevent, we know how to treat, we know how to fix. We're just not doing a good job of it. So how do we accelerate? How do we, how do we reach more communities and do so faster? Um, there are a lot of lessons that we have from Rwanda. There are a lot of lessons from the folks in the room, but today we want to specifically look at um, where technology Technology can enable and help us to kind of turbocharge our aspirations and strengthen those systems. But I want to start maybe with just a few cautionary tales. Um, we have a tendency 
um, as a society, as a species, to kind of fetishize um, technology and its power and its ability to transform just about everything. And that can oftentimes lead us um, down some, you know, uh, some, 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 some dark alleys and down some wrong paths. And, um, and I think there are cautionary tales from history. You can go back and look at the history of international development. Uh, take malaria, malaria eradication in the 1960s, uh, where there was a massive global effort towards, you know, one of the great silver bullets, DDT, um, an indoor residual spring to eradicate malaria, and actually came quite far in many parts of the world until some of the unintended consequences and secondary effects um, halted that effort. And in fact, we've seen in just recent years, thanks to climate change, a real resurgence in malaria. And we're looking at you know, a generation or two out, the possibility of a billion more people being exposed to mosquito-borne diseases because of climate change. More recently, um, anyone remember Play Pump? This isn't really technology, it's just a technical, but a technical innovation and a great example of how technical innovations in international development can fail. So in the early 2000s, the play pump was this really heralded, great, cool innovation. It was basically a merry-go-round that functioned as a pump, um, a groundwater pump. And the idea was we put these things in villages, kids are going to play on the merry-go-round, and it's going to pump water into a tank, and it's not work anymore. And they told a great story, and it was a cute-looking thing, and everybody went bananas. Not everybody, but the media went bananas, and in the States we went bananas, and they raised tons, tens of millions of dollars to start putting these pumps everywhere. And it was just a few years before all of those pumps that had been installed um, were, were abandoned. And the organization folded less than three years after securing a $10 million grant. So what went wrong for them? Well, first, the tech wasn't very good. It wasn't a fun merry-go-round. Um, you have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. It's not like you get a speed and then it just keeps spinning, and then you can just ride around and have fun. So the kids got really tired after like five minutes. Um, and then the moms had to push, and they, you know, that was more work than just pushing the hand pump. So they forgot to ask the kids if they liked the pump, or the parents, or the communities, right? They didn't design for and with their core customers. Right? They didn't look at the system and understand um, what are the needs of this community um, and, um, and how are we best going to solve it. It was a narrow kind of vertical intervention, and this is why it failed. And to their credit, they learned from it. Um, but I think there are a couple of lessons here that I've seen repeated again and again, and so I just want to start with some of those cautionary lessons for those of us who are thinking about the role of tech um, to make sure we can temper our enthusiasm and start with a little bit of humility. First is um, beware of riding the silver bullet train, right? There is no single solution to any one of these big and complex problems. The healthcare issues that we're looking at are deeply embedded in extreme poverty and social and economic and political systems right, that are excluding people, and we're not going to fix that with any one intervention. We're certainly not going to fix it with an app. Second, beware the sort of top-down approach to technical and technological innovation. We see this again and again and again, and here we are in the ivory tower of Oxford talking about solving the problems of poor people without a lot of poor people in the room. And so we need to be cautious about that. In doing that without proximity and engagement of the folks who are actually have lived experience with the problem is very, very dangerous. So the top-down and outside-in approach to innovation is one that's destined usually to fail. Third is taking too narrow a view and actually ignoring the entire system. And, and, and we'll talk more about this. So these are the, some of the things that I would say to sort of watch out for. Um, we're in a room full of people who care about community-based care, and I'm really excited about the speakers to come. Um, so let's think about the possibilities and how we could kind of approach this a little bit differently. Because there are two things that I would suggest as sort of um, approaches or thinking about the how um, to think about technological innovation to help us build stronger community healthcare systems. And the first, that was in the title of the talk, is treat the system, not the symptoms. Right? The idea here is that technology can play really important roles if we look at the entire sort of healthcare system and we understand where are there gaps in the system, where are there gaps in skills, um, where is the system breaking down, and then um, how can we use technological solutions to help the system work more efficiently. Right? If we're thinking about an app to allow community health workers to collect better data, great, but does that app help? community health workers make better decisions. 
who, who does that app talk to? Where do the data go? Does that app help connect community health workers to the health centers and the doctors and nurses who are working there? Does it align with national data systems or is it gonna be a parallel system that's gonna be broken down, right? How many times, dozens, I've seen dozens of apps or softwares um, for you know, better reporting of data that ultimately don't scale and end up failing because um, they're too narrow and they try to do their own thing and they don't talk to the rest of the system. And that's just one of many, many, many examples. Um, so you start your innovation journey by mapping the entire healthcare system um, and, and, and understanding the context as well and then trying to find levers for change within that system and those are the opportunities I think for technological innovation. Second is lead with equity. So what does that mean? Equity, when we talk about health, is simply talking about the right to health, and that's the idea that every child, woman, and man on the planet deserves access to high-quality health care. Sounds simple. I would wager that everyone in the room, or virtually everyone in the room, agrees with that. Our approach in public health tends to be a little bit more utilitarian. We share that aspiration, but in practice, we approach the problem a little bit differently. And utilitarianism or out effective altruism would encourage us to think about doing the most good for the most people with the available resources. The problem with those kinds of approaches is they often exclude the most vulnerable because the most vulnerable are the hardest to reach. Um, they're the most difficult, the most complex to reach, and oftentimes it's actually more expensive and more challenging to reach those folks. One of the things that we learned in Rwanda is that an equity agenda forces us to think differently. Rather than say no, we have to ask how. And in fact, if we try to solve for the most vulnerable and the hardest to reach last mile communities, that unlocks new opportunities and new innovations that actually make our solutions easier to spread and scale across contexts and geographies. And the history of Rwanda's health system evolution over 15 years started with, let's go to the worst off places first. And we're not gonna do it anywhere unless we can do it everywhere. And if we can solve the problem there, then we proved we can do it everywhere because we've already overcome the most difficult obstacles. And that was what allowed many of those innovations, which a lot of them were not necessarily high tech, to spread really quickly across the country and doing the basics really well led to an 80% reduction in child mortality in 10 years and a number of other great statistics. So treat the system, not the system, symptoms, and lead with equity. Um, I just want to share a few observations. Let's see, This is what happens when I improvise. A few observations on some of the areas where I think technology can be really well placed um, to, um, to address some of the challenges that we all care about. Um, first is in training and empowering and extending the reach of health workers. Those can be nurses, community health workers, and many, many, many others. Um, we've seen some great examples by folks here in this room um, and, and here at the forum, uh, like the Community Health Academy that Last Mile Health is building. We're using the power of online, not only online training, but online platforms for learning um, collaboratives can really decentralize and turbocharge our ability to train more effectively more health workers, to empower them to make better decisions, and to enable them to both generate more effective data and, and, uh, and actually to make better decisions as a result of that. Second is to empower patients, and that's not just with health information, but also to empower patients to dignify their healthcare experience uh, and actually to understand their rights and be able to drive improvements in the healthcare system. Third is improving the systems, both information systems and supply chains. Some great examples, one from Rwanda is Zipline that many of you have heard of, which is a program that's using drone delivery um, to deliver essential um, uh, medicines and blood products to remote rural mountainous healthcare facilities. That's been brilliant. Last week at the cancer center we started in northern Rwanda, there were eight deliveries of um, life-saving emergency blood products for kids with cancer in one week. But that system, that company is only working because it's embedded within the system through a public-private partnership with the government and so it's talking to the rest of the supply chain. 
And then finally, there are lots of examples where we could go of using technology to bring the fruits of modern medical science to the people who need it most. Uh, you know, we have a young woman who I met when she was a 10-year-old um, who lost her leg in a, a failed attempt to treat her osteosarcoma, her bone cancer, um, who since survived um, and, uh, and uh, uses a prosthetic whose dream is to use 3D printing to develop low-cost prosthetics for other folks with, uh, with physical disabilities and amputations across East Africa. Um, so those are just some of the examples. Um, we have a terrific, terrific group of folks here who know a lot more about this stuff than I do. Um, I just want to really encourage you to, uh, you know, I really believe that this notion of health for all is something that we can attain and we can attain within really our lifetimes, um, but it's going to be really hard to do. Technology has to be an important part of it, but we have to, as I said the other night in the opening plenary, we have to sort of lead with both optimism and urgency, but make sure that our big ambitions are also tempered with humility um, and really grounded in proximity. Um, so the messages I want to leave you with are lead with equity, treat the system, not the symptoms, and that's all I've got to say. Thank you. questions or comments or devastating critiques, <laughs> feel welcome. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, for that grounded wisdom before we start. Uh, now we can move into our phase of techno-optimism. <laughs> no, I'm sure many of our panelists will um, hopefully share with you along the way some of the ways that they are actually living into, um, I think, that sage advice that Peter just shared. So we're now going to move into our first panel. This one is around bridging the gap. I mentioned that those um, health workforce gaps. So how are some of the ways that uh, organizations are using technology to actually embed health innovation into the everyday lives of people uh, where there may not be enough health workers to actually have those face-to-face -face encounters. So as I call your names, you can come and uh, take a seat. So first we have our moderator, Andrew Jack, who's a global education editor of the Financial Times. Thanks so much. You're going to get this mic in a sec. Uh, and then we have Akash Ganju, who is the founder of uh, Saad Health, uh, working in Mumbai in India. Debbie Rogers, Managing Director of PrayCult.org uh, in Johannesburg in South Africa. Michael Capps, who's the CEO and founder of TNH Health in Brazil. And then Sarah Milan, who's the Behavior Science Manager, um, Johnson & Johnson's Health and Wellness Solutions. Thanks so much, Sarah. Have a seat. So a, a lovely international and diverse panel. Thanks so much. Take it away. Great, thanks, thanks very much, and um, thanks, Peter, for coming to us rather than the Oxford Union. I must say, I think a much more insightful and um, very informed audience, and I think it's very, it's very important that in this discussion we'll start with some discussions amongst ourselves, but really want to flip it over to you for your reflections and opinions more generally as well. And I think your, your thoughts on um, the nuance of tech, as it were, really, really valuable. Um, instead, I'd say, you know, so from a different background, working for a number of years at the Financial Times, it's kind of an interesting parallel because the FT has really gone from a entirely print-based product to a very largely digital-based product um, and clearly technology has been a very useful tool for us in many ways but the fun you know technology is an enabler you know the underlying value of the FT I would say is the content and that's ultimately about human input um, not about the technology itself which helps facilitate its delivery as it were um, and so um, we're going to talk this afternoon about health, and of course, that's a, a field where there's a huge amount of intersection and innovation around technology, but absolutely important to think about the, the nature of the interactions with humans, with patients, with physicians, with the wider community. So, so maybe let me start with you, Sarah, from, from J&J, &J, and we were talking earlier, and you, you actually have a background in behaviour science. It sounds like a number of others at J&J &J do as well. So give us a little bit of a perspective on behavioural science and why and how that's important in healthcare. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So behaviour science, um, particularly important in the 21st century, has always been important to healthcare, but in terms of the 21st century now, I think it's more that we're more aware of the value of behaviour science. Um, and I think it's important to recognise that although we understand that behaviours are important, um, there's been a tendency to think of um, that 
we're just if we just tell somebody to do something they will do it um, and unfortunately um, some of the, the the famous slogans we are not just doing it um, there may be prevalence of non-communicable diseases um, there may be uh, preventative health care um, that we're aware of. There are also government guidelines that are telling us what to do, how to engage in healthy behaviours or how to avoid engaging in risky behaviours. And yet, the um, majority of us still don't know necessarily how to um, put that into practice. And that's essentially because, and I think it was uh, touched upon previously, thank you, Peter, um, that this is very complex. We are complex human beings um, at the individual level. <coughs> There may be factors that influence whether we engage or don't engage in a behaviour, socially, culturally, um, environmentally, uh, organisationally, policy-driven uh, factors or determinants that do influence whether we engage in a behaviour or not. So I think it's important that um, in the 21st century now, we understand that although we know what to do, behaviour science um, has told us uh, where there is a problem, why there is a problem, uh, but now we're seeing that behaviour change, behaviour change theory, can um, show us how to intervene. Um, and that moves to the next point of behaviour change theory, really, that um, it provides us with a very logical step-by-step -step approach by which we're actually always thinking about these outcomes, um, the organisational outcomes, whether it's at the hospital setting, whether it's always a health outcome. We should be designing health interventions with the health outcome in mind um, and not getting too caught up in the technology, innovation for the sake of innovation. Um, and behaviour change theory, when we go to our evidence-based laurels, um, we can use behaviour change taxonomy um, and select some of the behaviour change techniques, which we call the active ingredients, um, that allow us to target specific determinants of behavior, so what I, what might motivate myself um, to engage in a behavior, to target a health outcome, to target an organizational outcome. And just to put that into perspective, it might help that um, that's actually something we do with the Health and Wellness Solutions team. Within Johnson & Johnson, we follow a very structured logic model. So for example, if we think about at the top of this ladder, organizational outcome, Let's say for thoracic surgery, we want to reduce the length of stay in a hospital. We need to think about what is the next step that can help us target that. We need to think about an individual changing an individual health outcome. Uh, that might be reducing uh, post-surgery complications. And then we move to the next step. Okay, so what behaviours do we need to target in order to reduce some post-surgical complications? Uh, we, we look through the evidence, we, we do our best to um, speak with domain experts, and you'll see that there is a lot of evidence to support quitting smoking, a very complex behaviour, as I'm sure you all know. Um, and then we move to the next step. So if we want to look at these behaviours, preparing to quit, reducing to quit, possibly nicotine replacement therapy, um, what determinants will dictate whether I engage in those behaviours. And then finally we get to the, the ground of uh, the basis of everything that we do, the behaviour change techniques. Um, so you can see how we're step by step put, piecing together a string of pearls uh, from a measurement and evaluation perspective that keeps us grounded in the science and make sure we don't run away with an idea, get caught up in innovation. We can step by step measure and follow. Are we aligned with our health outcome? Are we aligned with our organisational outcome? And that helps us um, moving forward as we apply technology. OK, thanks. Maybe we'll come back to some more examples a bit yep. later. But, but Debbie, Debbie Rogers, let's talk a little bit about, about Mums Connect, Mum Connect. Tell us a little bit about how that came about, <laughs> how it works, how you're trying to tackle the issue of or the thin coverage sometimes of healthcare workers and so on. Sure. Um, so in South Africa, we still have an enormous problem with um, maternal health outcomes, despite some some good progress being made. Um, and back in 2011, I believe, we started a program to see whether or not sending um, information to mothers could help them change their behaviour. Um, and quite a I'm sure you'll, you'll have a lot of critique for the way we did it initially in 2011, sending out discrete packets of information to people and hoping that they changed their, their behavior. Um, and we found that 
surprisingly, when we sent an, a, a, an SMS from a system, the mother responded to, the, to the, the SMS. It sounds obvious now, but at the time we assumed people would know that a computer was at the other side of it and not a human being. Um, but actually they felt that they had signed up at the clinic and it was probably their their clinic, uh, the nurse that they were speaking to uh, through this system. And we saw that um, despite giving them what we thought was a great uh, set of content around how to look after their child in a stage-based manner. They had all kinds of questions that we hadn't anticipated all of the time. Um, and in South Africa, you have very little opportunity to meet with your healthcare worker. Um, you will go to a clinic, you will probably take all day just to get about 15 minutes of time with your healthcare worker. And if you're trying to save up all your questions and get all your questions answered in that period of time, that's certainly not going to happen. Um, and there's very else, little else out there that is trusted information. There are a lot of um, beliefs that may be passed down through mothers and various generations that are extremely harmful. So how do we start to, to help people through that? Um, and clearly just sending discrete packets of information wasn't quite enough either. And so what we've been looking at a lot is instead of just thinking of the systems that we build as a way to send information to people, what about thinking it, of about it more as a conversation um, between yourself, or the, yourself, the health system, if you represent that, um, and the patient as well as the healthcare worker? Um, and so we've built up some technology that helps us to have these conversations, but to do so at a really large scale. So in South Africa, Mom Connect um, is in 95% of the public clinics. We've signed up 2.6 million mothers in the last four years, and that represents about 80% of the mothers who give birth in public clinics um, over the last four years. So it's very large scale. Um, and we're having to operate everything with quite a small amount of resources. So just to give you an idea, at any one time we have about 900,000 uh, active users on the platform and they generate about 1,500 questions through to the help desk every day. We have four help desk operators uh, who have to deal with all of those questions. And so we've been using natural language processing not to remove the help desk operators from the system, but rather to help the, to improve the efficiency and the quality of the conversations that they are having with the mothers. Um, <coughs> and the, the response from the mothers has just been astronomical. I mean, we get, and we get amazing feedback from the mothers. As an example, we can ask them for, uh, has, was your health, was your blood pressure taken at your antenatal visit? If so, um, what did the nurse tell you about your, your blood pressure? Did they refer you if they told you that you have high blood pressure? And this conversation is generating a lot of data that is helping to change the health system itself. So we are thinking quite systematically. <laughs> if P only Peter hadn't left, I could have uh, <laughs> made sure he understood that we do that. Um, but all based on, on this conversation with the patient and trying to put the patient at the, at the center of their own care. And, uh, but it, you know, this, this two-way conversation, I think, is critical because it's not <coughs> something that I think most health systems really are trying to solve. I think they're very much trying to supply services at a person, <laughs> very much like we tried to supply information at a person rather than actually um, being involved and engaging with the person around their own health care. And I do think while um, it's not going to be, techno the technology that we develop certainly is only solving a very small part of the problem, um, it really can have a lot of impact when uh, having these two-way conversations between patients and, and health workers and health systems. So it'll lead to some, as it were, standardised answers depending on the, the questions that are coming in. Exactly. but also when or whether um, the mother should come back into the clinic, for example. So it's helping to kind of deliver yeah, a much exactly. more efficient Yeah, exactly. So then so. they're not going to the clinic necessarily if they just, if they don't need to, yeah. um, but they have the access to the information they need in the meantime because it simply isn't possible for us to, in South Africa, with the number of healthcare workers we have, to be able to provide that kind of uh, engagement and care for every single mother and yet that's obviously what mothers need and crave if they're asking us so many questions. So let's move from South Africa to, to Latin America. Um, Michael, tell us a little bit about TNH then and what you're doing around perhaps some of these issues of personalization. Yeah, no, it was, it was really funny. I was listening to Debbie talk and I, I guess while you were working on your thing, the same thing was happening <laughs> on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> 
uh, because we are the same thing. We were sending SMS at people to try to remind them to take their medication, and they hated it. And then we began to see that actually a conversation was, was necessary. Um, but what, what we've done um, uh, in the recent, uh, in the recent uh, couple of months and, and, and in the years uh, with our conversation-based chatbots, as we call them, or these virtual assistants, uh, is a couple of things. Um, we found that in Brazil, uh, which is um, a middle-income country, more and more people are having access to smartphones. And Brazilians are one of the population that spends the most amount of time on a smartphone, about two to three hours per day. Um, and it's a lot of time in traffic and, and things like that. And so then what we began to do is really uh, look at the behaviors that already exist on social media uh, and things like that. People are already on WhatsApp sending you know, messages and memes and funny videos and things like that. And sort of trying to hack that behavior to get people to engage with healthcare. Um, it's sort of something that I guess uh, you know marketers were doing for a long time to try to get you to buy you know Coca-Cola or things like that. But we were trying to apply that to healthcare. How can we have a conversation around something difficult? And in our case, um, although we do have some experience with, with um, maternal health, we focus on mental health. Uh, Brazil is. Um, I think leads the world in, in the prevalence of anxiety disorder, extremely violent country, a lot of unemployment, and oftentimes mental health is sort of a gateway to other kind of diseases. But then how do you get people to talk to a robot, right, about, uh, about a number of different issues, about how they're stressed or things like that. We've seen an excellent example with Crisis Text Line uh, yesterday. Um, uh, we've, we've sort of been able to do that. And so that's what we do. So we, we, we create these chatbots on social media. We try to create all these techniques to try to get people to respond back to us and to answer uh, about their mood uh, just so we can uh, identify potential uh, symptoms or problems. And then once we do identify a certain issue, whether it's something that's immediate, that requires attention, or it's a kind of a chronic issue, then we can integrate that back with the health system and let you know, the healthcare worker know, or the, the nurse or the psychologist know. And that gives you this extreme scalability that we've seen working so well in South Africa. And of course, to make it work, you have to have, I guess, two things need to, need to function. I mean, the patient needs to be engaged. You can't just be providing uh, whichever information they want. You, so you have to take this design thinking approach. You have to look at the data. What kinds of questions are they actually asking? You have to think through their perspective. You know, you can't just, you know, you may say, oh, here, here's a, a good recipe for you to eat. The person might not have money for it, you know what I mean? Um, or, you know, try to resolve this issue. But, you know, you're not living in the slum and having to deal with, with violence. So you have to talk about these issues. And so sometimes that's, that's a little bit difficult. And the second thing is trying to apply some more cutting edge technologies like natural language understanding, um, and uh, you know, machine learning to try to personalize things. Otherwise, you're just going to lose that person. Um, and if you can do that, then you can get access to those risks. You can respond to them, and you can have scalability within the healthcare system uh, overall. Exactly. You were talking about it. obviously we don't have illustrations here, but like some of these memes and so on. Have you got a kind of tangible example you might describe for us um, how that's worked? Yeah, I mean, so you know, we would look. So we would. Look, we, would uh, we have an entire. It's actually pretty fu funny. Ima imagine this. You know, saying uh, this to past generation, you know, to explain to, uh, we have a lot of people on our team, we have an entire content team of, you know, clinical people, but non-clinical people, and they have to try to explain to their grandmother that they're basically on Facebook all day and creating memes and GIFs <laughs> and trying to explain what that is. But, you know, it could be things from, um, uh, things from uh, current media, uh, sometimes celebrities, um, sometimes, I mean, you've all, you've all seen the internet, you know, trying to, uh, you know, uh, in terms, especially in mo emotional health issues, you know, stressful day and things like that. So kind of these animated things, but also trying to be very careful about it, not just creating entertainment for entertainment purposes, but actually having clinical validation um, behind that. Uh, that. That's sort of how we, uh, how we get it to, uh, to work. Um, I, afterwards, I can, I can show some other funny ones that, that we use, and, and that's what engages people. That's why people open it up and they, they have that channel of communication. Okay. So, so Akash, tell us a little bit about South Health and what you're doing. Yeah, so we at uh, South Health have been very interested in the role of non-traditional healthcare workers, and you know, not because we wanted to be, but because we realized that the the gap between demand and supply is so huge and continues to expand, almost not possible to navigate if we continue to do uh, look at the same solutions. So we started looking very interestingly at the role of the the neighborhood uh, in India. They're called Kirana stores, the grocers. Uh, think of them as the 7-Elevens in the U.S. And uh, and I'll talk about how and why we got to the, the, the potential po role that these Kirana stores could play in the healthcare supply chain. But before that, I need to talk a little bit about why we do and what we do and how we arrived at this because it, it seems crazy to, to start thinking of the Kirana store as a as a healthcare worker. Certainly, my, my physician friends would would laugh me out of uh, out of this room if I shared this with them. So. 
So what we do at South Health, our mission is to build healthier childhoods. Uh, we focus on low-income parents uh, in slums of Bombay and Delhi with, uh, with children between zero to six years of age. Why we focus on them is because there's tons of data talking about how the health and nutrition metrics, the immunization metrics for many of these children in urban slums is very underwhelming. Some of these statistics compared to some of the worst areas in, in rural India. And so that's a negative part. On the positive side, I think there's a huge opportunity for, uh, for really helping the parents of these, of these, uh, uh, of these children uh, dream the dreams that they want to dream in order to make sure that their children get the right health and nutrition inputs. So when we started thinking about how can we help these parents get their children the right health, nutrition and early development inputs between ages zero to six, we, the way we do that is uh, by building a digital ecosystem. So on the, uh, on the consumer side, we have, uh, we have an app for the families uh, which, uh, through which we push out uh, health, nutrition and cognitive development information uh, in an entertaining, gamified fashion. We're very clear that our competition there is not the, the, the health information that's being uh, doled out by the ministries. Our competition there is YouTube, Bollywood, entertainment channels where people are spending their time. And we have to find a way to get into the minds of our consumers, especially when, it, when we are talking about preventive health information. We're not talking about, we want kids from, uh, we want to prevent them from falling sick. In order to do that, we have to get into the minds of our parents before they fall sick. So, so we push out entertaining, gamified information, and then we are aggregating the demand of these consumers uh, in partnership with, uh, with, uh, with neighborhood merchants and health clinics. Why are we thinking of the Kirana stores? Uh, it's very simple and in, in hindsight, it seems very intuitive. We basically mapped the, the lives of 250 families living in the slums of Bombay and Delhi. We said, let's go and identify the touch points that they have in the course of a month. Who do they touch points with in, in their community? And it was amazing that the, the frequency of touch point with the healthcare worker was once in three months. And they were touching their Kirana store every day. They were touching the tea vendors in their communities every day. And when we stepped back and we realized, let's start thinking about these families from the lives that they lead. They don't go to the healthcare worker every day. They don't think about the healthcare worker every day. So if we want to start to get into their lives and start influencing how they think about preventive health, we've got to give them touch points through to, through, uh, through partners that they have a relationship on a daily basis. That's what led us to the Kirana store. What we do right now is that we have a partnership in, in one slum, large slum community in Bombay with 20 Kirana stores. It's very early, but we've seen extremely encouraging results. So of these 20 Kirana stores, we've seen that they've on, they, they, they do two things. They onboard families in the community onto our app, but more importantly, they, they are beginning to have preventive health conversations with these families. So about 67% of the families who've been on our app for about 12 weeks told us that they have started proactively talking to their Kirana stores about children's nutrition. We did not expect that to happen. This is just within 12 weeks and we didn't even give these Kirana stores any tools to talk to. On the other side, the Kirana stores, 77% uh, of them said that they've started proactively talking to their families about children's nutrition, right? It's very early, but we think it, these are very encouraging signs and you know we need to start imagining uh, out-of-box scenarios here. But there are 12 to 14 million Kirana stores in India. Whatever small proportion of them could become our partners in serving the preventive health needs of our communities, right? They have the infrastructure in the community, they have the relationships, they have the trust of these consumers. Can we find a way to leverage them not to replace healthcare workers because our healthcare workers are completely overburdened. Can we find a way to, re to use them to augment preventive health conversations in helping triage these families towards the right healthcare worker? We think it's a very encouraging uh, sign. It, it's early days for us, but we are going to spend a lot of time trying to build up the capacities of these Kirana stores in addition to building our relationships and partnerships with other healthcare services. So, so let's just go back to one of Peter's introductory remarks around that issue of equity. Because um, one can imagine with technology, even though a lot of your interventions seem to be particularly or significantly targeting lower income communities, you know, we've got everything from bandwidth and ac access to mobile, let alone smartphones, but, but also um, more widely the issue sometimes of payment and so on. I mean, who's got some reflections maybe about whether it's the digital divide risks opening up rather than closing that gap between the, the hardest to get and the lowest income versus the wider population? 
I, I think it definitely, you know, I think it, the wealth of knowledge that those of us who do have smartphones and can easily pay for access to, I mean, there's just an enormous amount of information and fantastic apps and all of those sorts of things. Um, and, um, but I think what we always try to do is design for the lowest common denominator first. Um, we do, all the work that we do is mediated by technology and so, you know, there are people we will not reach. Um, and um, and that is the, you know that's a sad part of the, the work that we do. But market forces mean more. We're reaching more and more people every day. Um, but if you can design for the lowest common denominator, often that makes your your solution much simpler, um, which means that you can scale it more significantly. Um, and so things like SMS might not be sexy technology, but it is something that can reach pretty much everyone, um, or certainly in countries like South Africa where everybody has access to a mobile phone, if not a phone themselves. Um, and so, and, and what I like about the idea of designing for the lowest common denominator is that it puts so many restrictions on your ability to de design. You can't add all the flashy things, you know, um, and yet that means that you have to have a very simple message and a very simple thing that you're trying to achieve and that's gonna allow you to reach a lot of people. Um, and so I actually find it quite exciting to design systems with those kinds of, of restrictions because I think often they're just much simpler to understand and they're much simpler to, to get to, you have to get to the very core of what you're trying to do um, and so I think you know as, as long as you keep in mind this idea of trying to design for the the lowest common denominator hopefully you're going to be able to reach as many people as possible um, and there are a lot of market forces that we certainly can't be in control of that are driving more access to phones um, cheaper data all of those sorts of things and 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 so it's encouraging to see that that is changing and that we can continue to reach more and more people as that's changing I think that one of the biggest problems there that you touched on is is cost and so we always ensure that there, it is zero cost to the end user uh, because we've just in our experience seen even a very small cost means we reach about five percent of the people we could reach um, but that means someone has to pay um, it might not be the end user but somebody does and that definitely prevents scale um, and and we you know we have a very successful program in South Africa when I show other countries, what they have to pay on SMS costs every day, they don't take on the program <laughs> because it is extremely expensive to run. Um, it's about a, a million rand, which I don't know what that is in dollars, um, every single month. $150,000. $150, Thank you, Matt. <laughs> every single month just to, to, just to pay for the SMS costs. Um, and so I think, you know, if you are reaching the, the lowest common denominator, if you are designing for that, it does come with a massive price tag. Um, and, and there's still a lot of work that has to be done there to, to decrease that. that it's certainly not free. Certainly um, not. <laughs> yeah, no, and I, I, exactly, that, that's the case. Uh, but if you can align the incentives properly, if you can show that, look, we're investing, we're investing uh, in this uh, application, but actually generating cost savings so we're you know uh, preventing unnecessary visits to the emergency rooms or the specialists um, you know we are um, improving health outcomes which in the short and medium term will prevent uh, uh, other issues um, you know uh, even if you can if it's a if it's a political thing if you can even align the political interest like look look what you're doing you're giving transparency to what you're, if you can align that then all of then you can actually find the money and and I think um, that's where the, the power of technology comes in. There's obviously the digital divide. You have to have the device, and there's little you can do about that, but I think that's becoming less and less of a problem over time. It's just how do you align those incentives? How do you monetize and, and create a sustainable model out of these kind of services? Yeah. I, I do want to add, I agree with Michael. I think when you're designing for the lowest common denominator, you have to design for not where the lowest common denominator is today, but where they are going to be a few years from now. You're designing for the future, and this is a massively shifting landscape. Certainly in India, mm -hmm. we've seen a massive shift in the last two years probably in other geographies also. So I think we are talking about designing systems for the future, and I'm not saying 30 years in the future, but let's keep in mind that there are huge macro forces that is changing the landscape, and let's design for that in mind. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Oh, uh, just to touch on that, I think you raised a really valid point, um, and that's the beauty 
um, in one sense of the opportunity of technology, um, where we have behavioral science meets data science meets technology, um, we can start with the best guess. You know, some of our theories, they might be outdated. We're all kind of, we're all finding our way right now a little <laughs> bit, but we're collecting data. And the main point is that we have a strong measurement and evaluation pro, um, plan in place so that we can, you know, talk to the health outcomes, the organizational outcomes that we can, um, that we can achieve. And it's, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned this low, you know, keeping it very simple. Um, we kind of go with the same principle of a, a minimally viable intervention. What are the basic behavioral science requirements that we can um, embed in our health interventions to achieve that? Um, and then we want to test and learn. And I think that's the beauty, again, of BSI meets data, behavior science meets data science and technology. There's this capability to test and learn um, and, and not just think that this first, this first go round is the is the right one because it's 99.9 percent .9 the, the the opposite of that and 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 I think we have this opportunity in that collecting that data we can then optimize the next um, the next minimally viable intervention. Sure. May I just make a yeah, note on that? Sorry, um, I completely agree with that. One of my biggest challenges in the in the work that we do um, is that very few of the people who I know who are funding this kind of work understand yeah. the fact that it is not a perfect product that I am launching immediately and will work. Yeah. It is a process and you, can, you have to keep up with the massive changes in Absolutely. trends. Something I design this week is gonna be different next week and in two years time it's gonna be different. So it, you can't just buy an app launch it into a market and everything works. That's not how technology works. And unfortunately, there's just seems that there are a lot of people who don't quite understand that and want to be able to launch a solution. And that solution must be the thing. And it has to, then you never have to touch it again. <laughs> With clear metrics up With front. With clear metrics up front, you know exactly what you're doing. I mean, you know, the number of times I've had to imagine what the activities are gonna be that I'm gonna be doing in two years. Um, um, to try and make sure that I can get the funding. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I think there really needs to, we need to talk more about the fact that, um, that this, this is a process. We are continually learning, we are continually changing. Um, and having a good monitoring and evaluation process in place to, that not only is looking at outcomes, but also trying to learn as we go along and being able to show, and, and that's partly, our, you know, as tech implementers, we have to learn better how to show people that this is an important part of the process and to make metrics available that allow them to see progress so that we're not just you know we're, we're not just saying oh but we need to do the thing and people are saying well how many more times do you have to refactor the system surely it's done now <laughs> you know uh, we've got to get better at showing that but we also need people to better understand that it is not just a thing that you launch into the market and it's fine um, it's it is very much a process just one other thing briefly on equity, the um, just strikes me, but the question of literacy in multiple languages and mm -hmm. how far that's also an issue. It's, I deal with it in all of your examples. That's a problem with sort of you know text-based communication, for example. Oh, well, we have Mom Connect is in eleven official language in the eleven official languages of South Africa, um, but one of the major challenges that we have is that most of the natural language processing work that has been done up to date, up to, to today, um, is primarily English and primarily um, American English. Um, and so that, you know, we're having to, in a way, kind of reinvent the wheel because we're working with very resource poor languages. And so, you know, the, the AI that people think is like, wow, it's amazing, I can speak to Alexa and Alexa's gonna listen to me. That's not something we can actually implement for um, Tswana, for example, in South Africa. So there's, there's a big gap there and that is not, it, it's gonna take some time, I think, for that to be filled, yeah. Great point, and that's, you know, but then also there's a proportion of the population that even in whichever language might struggle to communicate Absolutely. to read, let alone to write in response. Yeah. But, so, so at least in India, in our segment, you know, we have something in India called Bollywood that really <laughs> flattens the, the, the playing field. Everybody gets video, everybody gets entertainment. So all of our content is video. 
uh, and you know, I, I am not the person to say this, but it has been said that the future in India is voice, video, vernacular. So we are going with that. So our, our content is vernacular video. Uh, we are generating user-based content in, in the vernacular video form. And that just, you know, it's, it democratizes information <laughs> access. Everybody knows how to consume video. Right. We'll come back maybe to some of this, but I'm keen to open it up as well if there are some questions. Yeah, please, over there. Do introduce yourself as well, please. Yeah, my name is Gabriela Salvador. I work for AmeriCares. Um, a question for you, Debbie, is right? So you're using SMS, right? Because you want to reach the lowest common uh, denominator. Do you have an idea of if you were using an application instead of SMS, how that would affect your operating costs? Because you're not paying per transaction. Yes. Uh, well, the biggest problem would be that we'd hardly reach any people. Um, Sorry, I am very much against applications. <laughs> I um, personally have found that the, the, the hoops that people have to jump through to download an application, to keep that application updated, um, and then their engagement based on that is, is very low. And our approach is to use, use uh, behaviors and systems that are already being built. Luckily, like we're using SMS and we're using WhatsApp and we're using other things that are already on people's phones to reach them. Um, and I think that that is really the, the key to being able to have engagement and scale. Uh, it just the, and, and applications sound like they're cheap. <laughs> In my experience, applications are very expensive. And the reason for that is that you have to be able to build applications that work. If you're talking to the majority of the population, you're not giving them a phone and you don't know what phone they have, you have to keep it, keep it running for so many different operating systems, so many different versions of those operating systems, that the cost to do that is actually very high. Um, I'm sure that the, the, it's, it's less linear. So the one challenge with the, uh, the SMS cost is very linear. You know, as you have more people, it mm. costs more. Whereas you do have a better curve when you're looking at the cost of something like an application where it does become more cost effective over time because it's not linear relationship between the cost of the application and the cost of each, reaching each user. But you do have to reach a very large number of people for that to become cost effective. Um, and so uh, I think that, well, certainly the approach that we're taking is to try and use more cost effective systems like WhatsApp, for example, rather than SMS to reduce those costs, um, rather than trying to build an application that people have to download. Okay, thanks. Uh, who else? Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Chantur Patak. I'm co-founder of Karenix Innovations. Uh, just to brief and give the context, we work with 300 plus health workers who are using the app in 10 states of India. Uh, and exactly we're working on the same problem statement of improving the dialogue between community health workers and the pregnant women. Uh, so my question is open to everyone. Uh, how do we basically generate the data of this dialogue between these two people? How do we quantify that? And what are the techniques, maybe coming from behavioral science, you see that how we can improve these dialogues. I know this is not like it can be our session, but some key points and we can follow up to it. Thank you. Sure. Um, you know, there's the great behavior science debate in some ways, you know, what works for whom, under what circumstances, when, toward what outcomes and why. Um, and so in some cases, it may be the face-to-face, the, -face, the actual communication. Um, uh, one of the projects that comes to mind is healthcare in conversations, where we're really thinking about the shared decision-making piece, um, facilitating a conversation between the HCP and the patient. So providing some facilitation methods to the HCP to, um, because they only have a certain amount of time. You, you can't change that. that. That could be one avenue that you could go down, but if you can optimize the time that they have with the patient by providing, um, and it doesn't have to be an app. It doesn't have to be a portal. It could be leave materials that have um, a step-by-step -step way to interact, to ask questions, ensure they're uh, ticking the right boxes, covering all the bases. On the other side, you can also have um, health interventions that target the patient. And that might be an app, but it might be a diary, um, them symptom mo monitoring, because it's sometimes difficult to remember how you felt last week, right? But if you're tracking it as you go, whether that's in a, a logbook or um, an app, you can go into your consultation 
and have that conversation with something in front of you. And that's a lot easier. That optimizes that conversation. Um, so there are many different ways to, to go about it, but I think it's important that we're thinking both HCP and patient, how to empower the patient, as Peter was saying, but also not overlooking the HCP burden and potential burnout, which is a, is a huge problem. Um, so I'd love to talk to you in more detail. Yeah, on that. No, I don't have okay, the background. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's easy, that's clear. I, can comment. I, I thought yeah, Debbie actual, might actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so I mean, uh, we do it, I guess, <clears throat> start simple and get more complex. So starting simple maybe means you structure a conversation. So, you know, and it's probably how, how it's done with Mom Connect, but you do, you know, depending on the gestational age, you have specific set questions. Then you create versions of that for different types of mothers or, or, or things like that. And then you start putting in all this fancy stuff like natural language understanding. Yeah. And then you move it to digital platforms. And so you kind of go like that. Uh, but you always have that skeleton there and you can, mm. you can be testing it at every stage. Yeah. One of the ways we're thinking about um, how conversations can help relieve the burden from healthcare workers is they're, they have a visit and then they have another visit and there's a lot of stuff that happens in between. <laughs> and so if you can help to um, have an engagement with the patient in between the healthcare visits um, and um, lift the burden from it being the health worker who necessarily has to respond to that, so perhaps decentralizing to something like a help desk, then it just it, it means that when the healthcare worker comes the next time, they don't have 800 questions to ask, they have the very specific one where they need to sit and discuss something. Or perhaps we've given them some information around, like you suggested, you know, this person now said they, they are hypertensive or you can give them information in between. So it's, it's definitely not about replacing the role of the healthcare worker. I think that it's critical. The healthcare worker is, is absolutely critical, but removing some of that burden. And I think it's working with the community health workers and with the patients to understand where technology can do that. We have, I have some ideas about it, of course, um, but as you work with people and you roll out your systems, you'll learn that there will be other ways that, that the, both the community health worker and the patient will identify they need they could have um, like a burden lifted off them if they had this kind of intervention. Sounds like you can carry on forever. After, be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, John Lutzby from Murray Stokes International. We work in sexual and reproductive health. Um, we're in the middle of trying to automate some of our interventions, and and in the quest to save money, have looked at using healthcare providers' individual phones to help identify the patients. And it's really raised some questions for us about data protection and privacy. So I was just interested from the panel to hear in, in all three, four of your settings, how are you thinking about that in, in countries where maybe the regulations aren't as strong, but where you might want to grow it into where it is stronger? I can, sure. I can start. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, Brazil is next year passing a bunch of legislation about regulation, um, and there's a lot of issues. Uh, for instance, SMS in the United States is not considered secure. It can be hacked and things like that. Uh, obviously, social networks, you have this adherence, but obviously it's not, you know, uh, I don't know what Mark Zuckerberg does with your health data. In fact, you, it's, it's an issue. It's terrifying. Uh, and then the issue is you can have a secure app, but then you have the whole issue of how people can actually download it and use it. Uh, what we found is uh, probably the easiest way to do it is through consent, right? So what you can actually do is you can text with people, but they're just very, very clear about uh, what data you're going to collect, the risks involved, um, and uh, more often than not, people will accept the risks and will provide that, that data to you. And then you do everything in terms of best practices on your side to prevent hacking and, you know, uh, code injections and other, you know, DDoS attacks and other things that could uh, potentially infiltrate your system. Yeah, I mean, we found the same thing. I think you need to be honest and upfront with the consumers about what data you're collecting and what you're going to use uh, use with them. We found our consumers, and I'm talking about low-income slums, people living on $2 a day, extremely sophisticated understanding of you guys are going to use my data and monetize my data. So we prefer to be upfront. This is what the data we are collecting. This is how it's going to be used. Because their understanding and sophistication is moving very rapidly, yeah. very, very rapidly. So we have to keep pace with that. Yeah, um, yeah I think... I think it's echo what these guys said um, and just make people very aware. What we generally try to do is even if we're working in a country that doesn't necessarily have very sophisticated laws, we basically look at the 
gold standard, what's the highest <laughs> level, and try to make sure that whatever country we're in, um, we're working around those kinds of restrictions because they're all catching up, right? Yeah, it's it's going to happen that you're going to have something as strict as GDPR in, in all the countries you're working in. So you might as well aim for that um, and, and, and make sure that... I mean, I think it does bring some technical challenges. So, for example, things like... Um, because we can't pass data in South Africa, between South Africa and the US, uh, we can't do cloud hosting in AWS, so it has to be locally hosted. And you know that adds cost and it adds a whole bunch of technical issues, but it's what has to be done. Um, and, so, and, and also, you know, we're gonna see changes that are gonna mean that it isn't as hard. That there are gonna be more locally hosted cloud services as the demand for that increases, and then we can shift over to these more sophisticated systems, but in the meantime, Meantime, you have to take some of those technical steps to protect the data, um, and you also have to take the sort of user design approach of making sure that your users ab absolutely understand what you are going to be doing. And in a way that is not, um, I mean, the one thing that drives me nuts in South Africa is that we have this Poppy Protection of Personal Information Act, which is also a very sophisticated one, and they say that you have to make um, it available to people to say what you're going to use their data for and, and they have to be able to delete their data and see what data you have all of these wonderful things but people make it only available on a website which is of absolutely no use to somebody who has no access to that and so I think you also have to think about how do you do this in a way that is very accessible to people and that's not always easy like on SMS and USSD to explain all the data you have for people is a little bit challenging but you just have to do it if you're operating ethically and it will catch up with you if you're not, so. <laughs> okay, good. Um, one last question. Sure. Okay, one last question. Uh, hi, really interesting discussion. I wanted to ask, moving away from just the relationship, the healthcare relationship between an individual and their health or whether a particular healthcare worker, obviously it says in the title community-based care. I thought it was interesting you mentioned earlier the idea of touch points to other points in the community. I was wondering to what point you might have thought about the role of um, other community structures or organizations in terms of sharing the burden or spreading the burden of healthcare. So whether or not that's communicating with local community centers or community groups or religious groups, whatever it is, whether or not there's, there's a, an expanded way to connect to people's wider healthcare. <clears throat> so we are certainly trying to do that, but we um, so we are working with healthcare clinics, the Kirana stores, the pharmacies, the, the individuals and the families themselves, the Anganwadis, uh, the, the the child centers over there. The problem is everybody moves at a different pace, right? I mean, everybody's at a different stage of evolution. Everybody has different things to do. We hope to get to a point where we show the value of this ecosystem to all the different players, and eventually they'll come along. Some of the, so the the reason we started first with the Kirana stores is because they had the lowest barrier and the lowest resistance, so it's easier to move along with them. But now, having proven the value of of this approach to to them, it's easier for us to have conversations with the other player players in the ecosystem. We'll get to a point where there is a role for everybody working together. Um, I think it's very dependent for me, certainly in the different countries that we've worked in. Um, and it's a lot about just tapping into what already exists. Um, so in Nigeria, there are very clear community structures with village elders and groups of people who look after the community. Um, in Uganda, there's um, what are called village health teams um, who are an individual who might just look after five households. Um, there's all kinds of different ones and I think the important thing is not to try and create something but to use the ones that happen to be in the community which I think is what Akash has done so well is identifying those and then just leveraging them. Um, but it's I, I haven't certainly seen a like silver bullet that it works in every, uh, every country or every setting. Um, it's about approaching um, the design of your system by first looking at what is available, what are the touch points, how can we involve them, um, and, and adapting to each of these different situations. I'd, I'd like to jump on that because I think I'm going to come from a slightly different perspective. Uh, complementary, very complementary. Um, <laughs> but community in the sense of not what we might typically piece together our, uh, a school organization uh, community a youth center but more a behavioral phenotype so we may have a very similar um, uh, behavioral path to quit smoking 
Uh, we might not know that, but the way we interact with um, a health intervention, uh, some of the data insights we can draw from that may suggest that actually we're quite similar. Um, so we can think of rather than individualized health interventions as subgroup interventions uh, in a similar way to community-based but behavioral phenotypes, so things that we can't necessarily see right now or may pinpoint to an environment um, or cultural setting uh, but come through from the, the data that we're collecting from, the, from those insights. <laughs> could go on. Quickly. Go on. Still another panel. <laughs> so thank you so much. That was a great far-ranging panel talking about really using technology to bridge the gap where there are not enough health workers from uh, AI chatbots through to bringing in non-traditional health workers like uh, Corona store owners. Our next panel starts to talk about where there is a health workforce how do we use technology to make that workforce more effective? And so this time we have our moderator, Ari Johnson, who's coming from Muzo. Thank you so much, Ari. We have Josh Nesbitt from Medic Mobile, who's joining us. Uh, Tali, I've got to get your last name. Ayanga from Datakind. And, um, and also Matt Berg from, uh, from Ona. Come and join us. Yeah, perfect. One extra. <laughs> One plus. Yeah. I can there we go. All right. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. A end of the day. Um, <laughs> yeah. A big week. But we've got an incredible panel of uh, folks here with uh, a lot of experience to share with us and uh, from three extraordinary organizations. And we're talking today about how uh, we can work together and how we can harness the power of technology to uh, enhance the work, the incredibly important work of community health workers. So uh, I really, I want to start with Matt uh, in this conversation and uh, I'm going to ask a question to each of the panelists and uh, we're going to start a conversation then we're going to really want to open it up. I want to hear from, from the rich experience uh, that's or in this room. So, Matt, Ona does really important work. Um, rather than disrupting, um, displacing or replacing community health workers, mm -hmm. really to enhance and support their important work. So, uh, tell us, how, how does that work? Sure. How do you do it? Um, so, to be honest, we're actually really new working with CHWs, but we have been working in the digital health space um, for a long time, more focus on kind of facility-based service delivery. And I'll talk about a project related to that too. Um, so we're really focused on this idea of how do we ensure equitable access to services. So if we're talking about service delivery, it really breaks down a couple, three kind of key components. One is, are services accessible where people live? Can we get those services to people? CHW is one of the ways that happens, obviously. Um, can we improve quality of care? Ensure that if you have access to a service, it actually helps you? because that's not a given. And third, which is I think one of the ones that we don't really talk about enough is, is that service affordable uh, once that person, or can the health system afford delivering that service? So the affordability issue. Um, so those are the three areas that you know, we've been thinking about the problem. Um, we've been working actually not with CHWs, but in the area of malaria, uh, malaria elimination with IRS, so indoor residual spraying, um, for the last five years with a group called ACROSS in Zambia. Um, IRS basically is the idea that you have to go household to household and spray like kind of insecticide on walls. And the idea is if you can spray enough homes in an area, you can eliminate, you can reduce the vector in that community and then hopefully move towards elimination. Um, so they do this not in, you don't do this in like Ivory Coast or in Mali where there's really, really high malaria rates. You do it more in areas that are, you know, where you can potentially move towards elimination. So Southern Africa is a big area. So this is in Zambia where we're working. Um, what we've done is in the last five years is we have we've have access now to high re resolution satellite imagery. So we can start to, you know, using humans right now, identify structures where people live. Um, uh, and then, so basically start to create a map of, of where we know where people are. Um, and one of the big issues in healthcare service delivery is we count what we do, what we see. We don't actually measure what is actually out there. So I call it like a Main Street problem. You walk down Main Street, you count the homes you visit, you don't count the people that live behind the garbage patch. Like even in every community, there's a lot of disparity, right? 
Um, so having this kind of map where we see where people live, um, we can then start to target services for that. Um, so with our IRS work, we've actually uh, developed a, an a, a approach where we can um, give the health worker, in this case it's an IRS spray team, um, the ability to see a map of where they're at and all the different structures on that map. And they click on the house of where they're at and then they mark it as sprayed or not. Or they can mark it as a non-residential. Um, so it's like this is a, a kitchen or it's a commercial shop. Um, or we can mark it as refused. Um, so as we're going along, we're basically um, painting for that community, uh, filling in kind of coverage for that day for service delivery. And in IRS, that's really critical because if you don't get to 85% coverage in that area, um, you basically leave enough vector for resistance to come back. And one of the things that Bill Gates and PMI is really um, worried about is resistance um, in these areas to these insecticides because they're not, IRS programs are not being done effectively. And there's a lot of coverage, anyway, I'm rambling a bit, but um, you know, we're able to basically go from 50 to 60% coverage, which PMI is getting, Presidential Miller Initiative, to like over 85% consistently, and also getting like post-event coverage surveys within 1% accuracy. So it really is really effective. Um, so we've, we know now that using technology, we can guide a health worker to a specific place, right? Um, and now we have a grant through Gates to develop this out in a platform called Reveal to broaden it for other types of campaigns. So for the campaigns, I think this is an obvious application, whether it's you know, immunization, um, you know, polio, um, IRS, you know, bed net distribution, things like that, mass drug administration. Um, so what, you know, we also work in, so we, we wanted to think, how do we actually bring this to um, uh, more, uh, not campaigns, but uh, reg routine healthcare service delivery. Um, and in looking at that, one of the big areas is analytics, right? So, I, so Medic and, and Musa have done some really great work around, uh, you know, how do we use data to monitor health worker performance, right? Um, so I think really the biggest challenge we're facing, like we're all kind of like slugging it out over CHWFs right now, uh, which is kind of dumb, because really it's like, I, 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 I tell people we're just building the picks and shovels right now for kind of the data, the managing the data is gonna be the hugest task we have because these health workers are not data scientists. Their, their managers are certainly not data scientists, right? So how do we identify risk in populations? How do we um, prioritize visits? Um, how do we um, um, manage health work workforce? These are all big data issues that we have to face. But the problem in all this is we also need a mechanism for um, action, right? And that is what we call the task. And in building this IRS approach, we actually realized, hey, if we can send a person to a place, that's a tasking data model. So you have a health event, you have the analysis, and then you have the task, which is the ta to tell them to do the next health event. So it forms a really nice kind of, uh, in Amazon it's called the, the spin wheel, or flywheel, sorry. You kind of get that momentum going, right? Um, so that's the idea of the tasking. So um, we've been working now with some support from J&J &J, um, to look at how can we take what we've done in IRS and apply it to, to routine to CHW health workers? Um, so we're looking at a couple of things. So first of all is can we just guide, can we improve prioritization? So you know, running, um, you know, we, we have a research partner in Bangladesh that has you know, 10 years of historical data on, on all their clients. Can we just better identify the high risk cases and make sure that you know, at the beginning of the day that map has a couple green spots that they have to visit? After that, let them do what they want. Let's make sure that those visits happen, okay? Um, so that's kind of one. Using that similar approach, can we ensure coverage? Can we make sure that, you know, in some kind of schedule, all the different areas are visited, right? Can we paint that map in a similar way? That's the second piece that's, I think, effective. Second is, can we optimize, right? So CHW uh, programs are, I think we bring in a lot of kind of paper and kind of um, we, archetypes of how we think about that. So like basically, I'm on this side of the road, you're on that side of the road, right? If your CHW gets sick or gets married or goes on vacation, the people on that side of the road may not may be dropped for a period of time, right? So UPS doesn't work like that. So if we can start to task, you know, we, can, we can start routing health workers to, to cover each other's territory and work in an optimal way, just like any kind of logistics company does, right? So can we bring logistics to, or Uber or TaskRabbit, whatever, you want to, whatever analogy you want to use to whatever, the donor is uh, to do that, right? So that's a, I think, exciting idea that we're, we're, we want to test. Um, the third idea, which actually is, I think, the one that I'm most excited by, is the idea of task shifting, right? 
Um, so it doesn't have to be about sending a person to physical location. It could also be about shifting the work off this, the health worker that already has a lot to do. Um, and I think of my mom. My mom's a retired teacher. You know, if she was living in a village in Africa, you know, and she had a smartphone, which is probably going to be the case, um, why can't she do the follow-up visit on the sick child um, just to do that checkup, right? So if we have that ability of tasking the orchestration, we can say, hey, CHW, you don't need to do it. We're going to assign this auntie who lives nearby to do that visit. Or most likely, we'll just have the family themselves just tell us how the kid's doing and respond, right? So that, that I'm sorry, I, I'm taking too much time early. So that, that's the, the last bit in terms of task shifting. I think it's a big idea. Um, relatedly, we also are looking at how this can use for a big problem in any kind of service delivery is coverage estimates, right? We, we rely on these mix and DHS surveys, which are terrible. You ask any nurse in a facility what their coverage rate is, 90%. Awesome. Of course they're not going get to out, get out and go, right? Because they think they're doing great. Um, so this will give us, can we use spatial sampling modeling and, and start to tell CHWs to fill in the gaps, to fill models, to build real-time estimates of coverage and make sure we're also not missing people on that map. Um, so thanks, sorry. <laughs> Fantastic. Sure. Thanks, Matt. So, so Matt just brought up that we need to be making more data-driven decisions, yep. right? Yep. And that's what our patients deserve, right? Uh, is a health system that holds itself accountable to doing data-driven work, right? Yep. And so, given that, uh, you know, th there's a challenge. A lot of uh, folks engaging in the system, making oh, decisions, so whether they're technology <laughs> developers, Sorry, I know. whether they're technology developers, or whether they're policy makers, they're looking at data in aggregate, right? Yep. And uh, at a, maybe a national level or a regional level, and they're not seeing the realities of the patient, and they're not seeing the realities of the community health worker. Now, turning to Josh, um, Medic Mobile is working to change that, and I'd uh, love for you to share with us the kind of design work that Medic Mobile has been working on. H how are you working to design for the patient and design for and with the community health worker. Hmm. Yeah, thanks. Okay. <coughs> First of all, Matt, I don't think you went too long at all, and we should okay. totally work together on like five of those ideas. <laughs> well, um, oh, I, yeah. So we're, we're we're being funded also to, to orchestrate. So the ta the tasking goes across platforms. So just think of it as an orchestration brain. Awesome. So anyways. right on. Yeah. Right on. No, yeah. it's, it's awesome. She made me do it. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, th thanks. All right. I mean. Where I have to start is that we are um, standing on the shoulders and next to uh, people who are accomplishing amazing things in global health right now. It is, you know, I'm looking at the room and I know the role a lot of you are playing and I'm sitting next to Ari and Matt and others. There's a handful of organizations and health systems that are achieving outlier results for the poorest people on the planet. And we all are, I think many of us are, we should be paying attention. Um, the cheat sheet for how they were doing that is at chwimpact.org. Um, you can also see it reflected in the latest WHO guidelines on community health systems. Um, so that's all really, it, it's all happened relatively recently, and I think it's on us to pay attention. And there are principles in how those systems are designed. The thing I, I want to say as a follow-on to that is that I know a lot of those organizations, and we know a lot of those health systems. There's also a shared, a, a relatively shared process. And it, mm -hmm boils down to patient-centered or human-centered design and a focus on equity. It's, it is the big idea that everyone deserves great health care mm -hmm. and deserves to live uh, the life they want to. And that is a pretty radical idea. And I think technologists should take it up. You know, we have IDEO and we have all these very fancy tools and frameworks, um, but it signals to this sort of core idea and so I guess what I would say is that the process for us has, has started standing alongside patients and their family members. And you know, the experience of having your health protected, secured, and living the life you want to. My mom's a physical therapist, so I really want to include um, all the, the very practical things like walking to church that you want to be able to do as a person. That's really what we're designing for, right? And if we start from that, and let's say that you're in a well-designed system, you're going to look over the shoulder of that patient, and you're going to see a, an accredited community health worker, right? And that person 
is, that, is, is related to that family probably in, in one form or another, a degree of separation. Um, they care about them and they have their own problems. They have their own things that, that they need to solve for. And if, and if we can successfully accompany them and s solve problems that they're really facing, um, we're on our way to a, a functioning system. If you look over their shoulder, you see a supervisor who, again, if you're in a great system, is showing up in that village to do rounds with the CHW. Mm -hmm. They have their own problems and their own challenges. Mm -hmm. we, have, we, can, we can bring technology to, to help solve for it. And I guess, you know, overall, what we've learned is that technology only can expand to the space given to it by system design. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having a sense of what's possible with the tech can help stretch the vision for the system um, and what might be accomplished with and for that family. Um, but it, it is not the intervention. Mm -hmm. It is not the solution. I guess maybe that's one of our biggest learnings. Mm. And to, as Medic Mobile is working uh, in collaboration with many other partners in the space um, to really toward this bigger mission, right? This mission of having this kind of software and these kinds of tools uh, available for everyone, right? And uh, that's uh, what the three organizations here are, are working to and many organizations in the room working together on this. And uh, the Community Health Toolkit is a big uh, um, new initiative getting driven for, just launched to try to make, help make this happen. So how is the Community Health Toolkit working toward making this kind of software accessible to everyone? What are the challenges along the way that you're facing? What's it going to take? And what's also the role of transparency in making it happen? Thanks, yeah, thanks for that prompt. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm reflecting on who's up here and, and um, the pan all the panels we've been on, right? And the questions that we often get. And I'd say maybe one out of every two meetings that we have, someone raises their hand and says, when is Google gonna solve this problem? When is Facebook going to solve this? Like, who? Well, they don't, you know, yeah. They do. It's every, every single meeting, they're and, and they're not. Yeah. They're not going to. Um, there are massive market failures in healthcare. Turns out it, it relates, relates directly to what um, companies do and don't build, and who, who gets these tools, um, where the locus of power is. Um, so, you know, I think it's just sort of on us to do things in, in a weird way and to do things a bit differently. And, for Medic, we looked at this and we said, um, we made the decision to take all of our assets, basically everything we had built over a decade, um, and move it out from under our organizational umbrella and into the public domain. And um, to, to try to start creating and contributing to public goods and not private goods. And um, that then has sort of knock-on effects where, um, you know, it's then on us to distribute expertise rather than consolidate it or centralize it. Again, like not what a tech company does. It's like a, it's a terrible idea to do that. Um, but I think if that if we can do that, and I'm sort of looking at all of us, if we can do that, then it it brings people closer. And like first and foremost, I hope it brings the people up here closer. And then you know I think um, has has ripple on effects. So public good, not private good, is is where we're headed. Mm. Uh, and I, I want to come back to this idea of collaboration in, in a minute. Um, I, it's so powerful and important at this time, um, and particularly as we think of the community health workers we're all here to support and stand behind. Um, they are uh, sitting and they are working and fighting and struggling at the heart of the communities that we serve on the front lines. And I, Tali, I, I want to hear from you. I'm so curious to learn more about how Datakind is partnering with community health workers um, to remove barriers using big data, to remove barriers to access to care in the community. Tell us more about that. Thank you, Ari, for that question. And um, also, thank you, by the way, J&J, &J for um, the opportunity for me and uh, on behalf of DataKind to be here on this panel because I'm a little bit surrounded by my heroes at the moment. So, <laughs> um, I think, um, Ari, before I answer your question, um, you know, I'm just looking around the room as well and so many people here, like, actually, your organisations are the ones that are actually on the front lines supporting the community health workers um, to... to 
reach patients and, uh, and change lives and directly impact lives there, save lives, to be honest, right? So I, before I answer, I just want to say where Datakind fits into this sort of larger ecosystem, right? So Datakind um, is a global nonprofit, and its raison d'être, if you want, is to actually um, support impact, the impact of high-impact organizations like the ones you all um, are leading. So um, in that sort of framework, the way Datakind works to support community health workers really is uh, to guide, at the core of our work is to guide data science, machine learning and AI expertise to organizations, right? These are organizations, for instance, if you imagine you're at the cusp of taking a solution that has been tried, has been tested, and you know, to, you know it to be true, and maybe you want, to, you want to scale this, right? That's just one example of where that sort of expertise might be relevant. Um, and sorry, just to clarify, the expertise is actually pro bono, right? Um, the reason, I mean, the, the way that actually works is we have, we have a um, huge network of over 20,000 volunteers um, experts, really, from, you know, right from academia, you have uh, from your MITs, your Princetons, and IITs around the world, um, to industry, your Spotify, Netflix, uh, Amazon, you know, and, and Microsoft, but also a bunch of self-taught geniuses, really, who are, all, who are all willing to offer their time in order to work with organizations in the hopes that they can use their superpowers uh, to make an impact. Right, so you have a really motivated group of people from around the world who are in those traditional tech industries in the, tr in the private sector, right, who are just looking to also see what are the possibilities out there. So when Datakind uh, partners with an organization, uh, there's, um, there's an opportunity to match the right sort of expertise to that organization's needs. But those organizations' needs, identifying those needs is, I think, something that's very core to our process and, and absolutely what you were saying, Josh, um, that really, fundamentally, we, the data scientists, the machine learning uh, experts, they are not the, we humbly accept we're not the experts uh, in the field. We're not the boots on the ground, we're not the eyes, we're not the ears, and we're certainly not the voices, right? So in order to have that partnership really work to identify some key problems What's really holding, you know, what's really holding an organization back from scaling that solution? If that's known to work, right? Maybe, maybe even what's the problem behind the problem? Like, can we have an honest conversation? So the space, we, we try to design the space when we <coughs> partner with an organization that we really identify the core issues, the core mo motivations as well. You know, what's driving you? So that ultimately, when we, when we articulate a problem statement, uh, we are in a position to, to actually co-create the solution. You know, Datakind's been around, I'd say, I think, <laughs> uh, yeah, for about seven, no, eight years now. And, to, you know, 250 plus projects later, I think the key lesson we've learned is that when those solutions get co-created, uh, then they actually get embedded in the organization's processes or in their operations. And that is basically become a metric of success for us. You know, so uh, whether you're working with CHWs, whether you're sending SMS texts, you know, ultimately how can, how can the, the, the expertise around just help you? Is there, is there a help? I mean, that's our approach. Like, can we help you, please? You know, <laughs> we'd love to help. Um, but looking ahead a little bit, you know, Datacoin has also been doing the sense, uh, um, the, 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 model where we work with one organization on a project and we deliver an outcome and a, and a solution um, and, and then, you know, that's, that's there. But I think keeping in with the theme of, of also the forum here, um, I think we're looking at a stage now when you, when you said, Josh, we should all be working together as well. Indeed, what are the opportunities to accelerate the possibilities for the sector at large, right? And this is where now I think our, our, um, our core focus is going to be on that. And yes, it's going to take big data. Yes, it's going to take some, some analytics, but maybe, maybe not. It, it depends on how we define the problem together. And it, defi and it depends on what solution is really going to make the most impact. So I think, yeah. Thank you, Tali. And so 
All three of you have called out the need and vital importance for more collaboration in the space. I, I love that. And we know, we know, we all know that the tech space is incredibly fragmented right now, devastatingly fragmented. It is a graveyard of fragmentation, right? Um, and so what is it going to take? What are the barriers in the way? Why is it still this way? Um, what are the barriers to actually getting real collaboration to happen between organizations working to develop new tools and technologies? And also, most importantly, with our government partners uh, who are uh, sovereign and leading the charge for their nations to make this big change happen. So how do we, what are the barriers to getting collaboration right? And how do we overcome them with government, with each other? Um, uh, let's start with you, Matt. Sure. Okay. Uh, so, I'm a as a technologist and like thinking it from a systems perspective, I'm actually super optimistic because, um, you know, we're still working on that 20% of the original problem, which is the client piece. And honestly, I think like the closer you are to the client, I think like let's be honest. I think there's a lot more room for customization, localization. There's going to be. I don't want to like maybe I have more support, but I don't want to disrupt the local I quote you VAR company that has built something that's it's great and they like to use it, let them, let them use that, right? So, um, but if you go up the chain and like around, especially around data and standardization, that's where things get a lot harder and I think that's where specialization comes in, right? And there's a huge opportunity for us to coordinate there. So just like one quick example, like I'm part of uh, some working groups at WHO that are creating um, like, how do we standardize clinical guidelines in a way that can be de deployed across applications? One of the, out in, a, in a consistent, so how do I replicate, how can WHO publish an ANC protocol in a way that they can guarantee different apps build it? Because if, if you look right now, everybody's rebuilding ANC. And there's 80 million flavors. It's like Baskin Robbins, right, or whatever. Which is fine, but for, if, you're de if you want to make sense of, if you want to create a common analytics platform for that, if Datakind wants to be able to compare across countries, like, what that data actually means, you have to have standardization. Um, so there's this thing called, without getting too technical, a thing called FIRE, which is basically based off HL7. It's a way of representing, it's a data exchange to exchanging health data, but it's also a way of representing a data model in health, okay? And one of the outcomes of we're thinking is, can we, can we as a community, um, just like we, we have this in form authoring around XForms, um, unite around uh, profiles, which is basically like, agreeing on a use of FHIR to represent common uh, primary healthcare things. So basically, in English, um, can I represent um, an ANC visit in a standardized way in a data model, or an immunization visit, or a postnatal care visit, right? If, I, if my system could output that data in that common format, and FHIR makes this all really possible, um, then I don't really care if you're using Medic or OpenSRP or, or ComCare or whatever, because um, it's all going into the same shared health record. And interoperability, I, I know it sounds magical, but it actually does make that kind of possible. Um, but more importantly, it allows the data kind or another group to then specialize on just that issue of, of data analysis and be agnostic to the client. Because right now, we're, we're, it's, we're so coupled to all the way down to the, to the end use, right? Um, so that's just a, one example that if we can, then if governments can endorse, hey, use whatever you want, but your app has to, follow this WHO endorsed profile, and we all sign off to use that profile, then we start solving problems for people that we create, in a way, so. Awesome. Right on, and I just, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. I think, in a way, I feel like I've failed to get, um, I'm just looking around, people in this room and, and, and not in this room, hmm. excited enough about that. Mm -hmm. uh, you might, say, you might say fired up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Fire is gonna be a big word, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, I think either organizations like ours mm -hmm. get supported to work towards that vision or it gets way worse, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it, we're, it feels like we're at that moment. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, Tali. Ari, I'll take a slightly different approach <laughs> to that answer just because I can't speak with much authority about interoperability, <laughs> interoperability of data or yeah. fire. Um, but I think... One of the things that when you when you were asking that question that just sort of got to me is, um, you know, I think one of the, and I've learned some of these nuggets, by the way, over the uh, past few days at the Skoll World <coughs> Forum. 
And uh, I was at a workshop with, with, um, with Molago uh, that the, Molago was running, and you know, they were actually saying that there is a role that uh, technology has to play in actually creating fidelity around your solutions when you're scaling them up, you know, and working with partners who are not, if you're not, in, if you're not the one scaling up your own solutions and you're actually going to work with other partners, maybe with governments, right? So there is that role that technology can play in, in building that. And I think that there is a sense then that you also, um, in, in order to have a good collaboration, you also can, can ease the path and ease the way towards that collaboration using technology. I mean, that's, that, I mean, Josh, you, you seem to be nodding. I think you, yeah. you, maybe you can articulate better what I'm trying to say. No, um, right, on. right, so there's, there's that part. And then the second thing is also, uh, data kinds model is essentially working with, with organizations and other impact partners. So collaboration at that level as well fundamentally relies on, on a foundation of trust. And uh, I think there is a, um, I know this might sound really obvious, um, and you mentioned IDEA as well. Ideas did another talk earlier and they were just like, well, the foundation for that is actually listening. <laughs> and uh, that sounds really simple, but it seems to be a critical step most of us miss. Yeah. Um, so building that space to understand the needs and the solutions and are they actually matching up together um, is something that we take to heart at DataKind and in our own sort of engagement with our partners in order to create that, that stage to co-create co solutions. Yes, fantastic. Okay. Just 10 seconds. Yes. More. Just to add very, I totally agree. Someone introduced, said, said two words that I think will stick with me, mm -hmm. that there is this invisible mesh that exists across organizations. People were trying to learn stuff together and that exists in community health right now and we need to support it. And it's all sweat equity and it's all extra hours. And there's not a learning officer who's talking to other learning officers anywhere. <laughs> and that feels insane to me. So I just, I feel like there's enough organizational and country level buy-in, but just not enough support for that mesh. Okay, uh, absolutely. So, so uh, collaboration takes sweat equity and it takes real equity uh, yeah. to make it happen, to make it real. Um, so before uh, I kick it out to our community here for more questions, I have, I have one more question uh, for our panelists here. Um, I, I want us to, to finish talking about power, all right? Because in the health systems where we serve, the folks who have the most responsibility to make change, the ones on the front line who we have to stand behind, our community health workers, our midwives and nurses, are often the ones in, invested with the least power uh, to make change in the system. So what role can technology play in transferring and, and shifting the balance of power? And this is for any of our panelists. <laughs> how, do we, how do we make that happen? Jeez. <laughs> well, who, who has the most power, in, in your opinion? <laughs> mm. so, so I have, I have one. So affordability, I think, um, like we have to unlock new ways of financing healthcare. And I think a big part of that is verification, that services happen. Um, I think for the most part, I brought up fraud earlier, I think for the most part, health workers, and nurses get far less credit for all the work they do. Um, and health systems are not accountable to the work that they do. Um, so one of the really thing that's happening on the technology side is, uh, you know, within the next year, um, biometrics, whether it's face, like using your face, your palm, or your finger, using just a camera phone, is gonna become ubiquitous. It's already available. Um, and you're gonna start seeing it introduced in health apps over the next year. Um, if we mirror that with, with, with a health platform, it becomes not just a health delivery tool, but a health service verification tool. We can prove that the woman was present for care, right? So we can create a digital signature saying, yes, proof happened. What that'll do is that will then create a system where um, performance-based financing, where insurance and all that can en enable um, uh, better accountability and then funding of health services, right? I hope. Um, but I think that gives power, though, to, the, to the, the women that are doing, and the men that do a lot of work that don't get credit for it. Mm -hmm. and, and, a vo and basically a voice saying, actually we're doing this, here's the proof. Mm -hmm. let's, let's hold the, the government accountable now to our work. 
-hmm. And I think donors can then hold the government accountable for, for making them, getting them paid and all those things, I think so. But we, we lack that accountability at the bottom that I think makes it easy to scapegoat health workers. All right, so verification is accountability, yeah. accountability is power. I, yeah, yeah. Maybe. All right, I like it, I like it. Any other thoughts on this before we uh, kick it out? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things about power or, or empowerment is about recognizing agency, right? Yeah. So I think the work that so many of your organizations <coughs> are doing are, uh, the, the effort is indeed to, to realize and actualize the agency of the community health worker. It's about also an agency to what agency to make informed decisions, not only about the care of their patients, but very much about themselves as well, right? So I think uh, tech can play a role, certainly, but I think just intentionality is, is a part of it as well. Intentionality in design, intentionality in creating those solutions that actually augment the agency of that community mm -hmm. health worker, recognize that health worker has not only the data that you're offering, but in their environment has a very good understanding of the other dynamics that are going on in that community. Whether it is to do with, you know, like dynamics within a household. You know, yes, you want to get that mum to the clinic, but is, you know, is mum the best person to go and talk to at the moment, given the dynamics going on within the household? Maybe we need to talk to mum-in-law, right? Or maybe we need to talk to the husband. So that kind of very fine, and I think this is related to the first panel as well, there's, there's some information that's just very intangible, very hard to get, but I think community health workers deeply understand uh, what is going to create a change in behavior or what might instigate a certain behavior and I think that there's a marriage there that's that's uh, super valuable uh, to augmenting you know so we need to design with that goal in mind Absolutely, fantastic Josh you get the last word on this well what I'd say in a sentence is that the, the community health workers that I knew that I know are doing everything in their power to care for their neighbors so maybe we should give them more of it is maybe what I would say Absolutely. Thank you, Josh. All right, let's, uh, let's bring it out to uh, questions from the audience. Thank you all. Um, would love to hear what is the little thing that's lurking at the edge of your mind and your consciousness of in the next 18, 24 months, like this is something that is lurking that could just dramatically change the landscape. Um, from a technology perspective in particular? Like, what is that thing that, you know, is at the very edge of your consciousness that you're kind of thinking, this could become an issue? At, uh, sorry, you didn't get your name. Oh, hi, I'm Kia. I'm the co-founder of Serum. I work in healthcare in the United States. Cool. Other, other thought is, how do you prevent, uh, this is a question specific to Matt, I'll give you as a second one. How do you, how do you ensure inoperability of data and prevent systems like we have in the US where there is a lack of inoperability of data and thus transitioning between different health platforms is basically impossible? Uh, I think the first question you asked was, uh, was really cool uh, because lots of possibilities. Um, I think I'm, I'm thinking more when you say what's at the sort of um, fringes, I'm, I'm actually thinking about the possibilities in the most positive yeah. sense, you know, because one of the things that from data kinds perspective, like I mentioned earlier, we, we, were, we were doing these individual projects to really supercharge, you know, the impact of individual organizations. But we've seen so much momentum in this space, in the community health work space, where organizations are really partnering up. They're really s sitting there and, and figuring out things like interoperability of data. But more than that is also, I think what we, what for data kind, we're looking in the next sort of 12 to 18 months is um, some key engagements with partners who will help us articulate those barriers, you know, that they, uh, where data plays a role or data, you know, where we can really use data science and machine learning to, to supercharge a solution. Um, because the likelihood is that many other organizations in the sector are facing similar problems. So the, the, the sort of optimistic view is, I'll say realistic optimistic view, is that w through those key engagements, once we sort of n nugget those key problems and barriers, and maybe even create some prototypes and solutions, then other organizations who may not be in, in the immediate sort of like uh, learning group or cohort may benefit from that. You know, because you create a prototype and suddenly 
especially one that's been guided by folks like if, imagine working if I imagine working with Ona and Medic Mobile and and Muso you know the kind of insight that we're going to get is just going to definitely benefit the sector as a mm -hmm. whole mm -hmm. whether you take it as a solution itself that mm -hmm. can be directly replicated mm -hmm. or maybe a prototype to inspire you yep. because if you don't know what you're looking for mm -hmm. you know totally. prototypes kind of inspire the imagination as well you know or just learnings as well you know, fabulous opportunity, I think, at the, at the moment um, with all the groups around in this room. Fantastic. And that relates to the question from Matt about interoperability. Yeah, if, cool. if what the opportunity lurking on the sidelines is much more sharing and collaboration mm -hmm. and the sp more rapid spread of cool. good changes, uh, what's it going to take mm -hmm. to cool. build that underbelly of it? You know? So I want to answer the first question first. So I think one of the biggest things, I think, that's, I think, really going to happen in the next 18, 24 months is um, buy-in. Um, so I'm actually looking at Ari, and, and with Muso, they painstakingly have built up, in Mali, I used to live in Mali, so it means a lot to me, um, evidence that this, this actually works, and to a point where the government is committed now to adopting CHW systems, not as a, an NGO thing, but as a government thing, right? And that's, if you can't, if you don't get government support, like, you know, so I think that's, that's a change. Right, mm -hmm. and I hope I think that if Mali can do it, other countries will do it. So I think that's a big thing that we need to. So first of all, Ari, that's really amazing, um, and second, um, I think that's really going to set the model for other countries. So I think that's a really big thing. Um, we're lucky in, in terms of interoperability in that it's pretty green acre, like green. What's it called? Greenfield, whatever. And yeah. that there's not a lot of systems in place, um, and um, so we can. There's a lot less to deal with. Um, but I'm also really, really big into working standards. So not going to some ISO committee, voting on it, it's a you know, WHO meeting. It's about, hey Josh, come on dude, let's get our stuff talking. Let's agree on what an immunization register looks like and let's just commit to doing it together, right? And we've seen this in the, the mobile data collection community around like ODK and there's underlying XForm technology and everybody now in the space uses it. You know, XLS forms, all these basic things. That creates so much value. We have to do the same thing now. And it's just working standards, you know? It's not ISO standards <laughs> or whatever, so. Right on. I don't know. Yeah, so agree. And uh, Kia, thanks for the question. I'll, just to add Please. briefly, I mean, uh, there's the looming question of China's involvement <laughs> in yeah. deals with African governments, I'd say. There's also, uh, for me, there's all these community health strategies being written or rewritten and an open question of whether or not those health systems will be designed to deliver mm -hmm. or designed to fail. And, you know, just I'm, put, I'm putting it in sort of stark terms, but um, the design will constrain what tools you can use, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's the biggest thing that will affect all the technologists. Yeah. Fantastic. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you to our amazing panelists. We're going to work to shift the power. <laughs> we're going to work to collaborate and partner hard. And uh, we're going to bring the field forward. Thank you so much. Thanks, okay. to everyone, for coming. Thank you.